Well, welcome to the History of LSK one-on-one -on -one sessions. I'm Junior Francis, alongside my good friend and the producer of this program, Eric Kohler. Now, this series celebrates and aims to preserve uh, and promote the Skia rock study and vintage reggae scene in Southern California and beyond through insightful conversations with legends and modern day talent, including those behind the scenes. Of course, as usual, a lot of people are working behind the scenes. So when you listen to this podcast series, or watch us on YouTube, many thanks for your support. And please tell as many people as you possibly can about this series. On this episode, we welcome author, lecturer, photographer, actor, radio DJ legend, reggae archivist, and a man who has incredible wealth of knowledge about the Jamaican music. Our longtime friend, Roger Stephan. Uh, you wear so many hats. <laughs> I, you know, this is just half of the thing. Going, <laughs> and I hate hats. hats. I never wear hats. <laughs> but Roger, I got so many hats. Roger, great to see you. <laughs> Wonderful to see you both. I mean, you're two of the people I respect most on this reggae scene that I've been part of for so long. This is my 50th anniversary year in reggae. Oh, my wow. goodness. Oh, congratulations. congratulations there, Roger. Wonderful. Wow, that's Wonderful. amazing. That is incredible. Yeah. And when you say in reggae, what do you mean? When you were a buck? Well, back in 1973, this is what Rolling Stone magazine looked like. It was printed on newsprint. Wow. And, oh, here it is. And then you opened it up to an inside cover. And in June of 1973, Countryman appeared on the cover of Rolling Stone, but they wow. spelled it, they spelled it country men. <laughs> country men. And this was an article called The Wild Side of Paradise by an, a gonzo journalist from Australia. And I, I quote this all the time just because it's so unforgettably great. Um, in writing about the reggae music, the first time I ever even heard the word, You're he, said, he said, reggae music crawls into your bloodstream like some vampire amoeba from the psychic rapids of upper Niger consciousness. <laughs> Why? Wow. Who is that author? Who is he? Michael Thomas. It later got uh, put into a book called Babylon on a Thin Wire. Okay. Oh, that's a writer. And, uh, so, I mean, I read that sentence and I was living in Berkeley. I, I literally ran out of the house to a used bookstore down on Shattuck Avenue. And I found a, a used copy of Catch a Fire, which was mentioned in the article, for $2.25. I figured I could take a chance. Sure. And man, uh, from the first notes of Country Jungle, I, I was mesmerized. I was mad. I was angry. How could music this beautiful exist a couple of hundred miles off the coasts of my country? Sure. And I've never even heard the name of yeah. it before, let alone right. being aware that the Israelites was reggae or my boy Lollipop was ska. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and a lot of the article was about the harder they come. So the next night, I went to a little theater on the north side of campus in Berkeley, uh, seated about 40 people, and they were playing The Harder They Come every night. And it was a full house. And when the uh, chalice scene came, you know, the midnight chalice scene where Leroy Smart is stealing everybody's money, mm -hmm. they, they all played themselves in real life. Uh, <laughs> uh, Chalice scene comes on. Everybody in the theater lights a spliff, and wow. there's so smoke. You can't see the screen. I'm I'm sitting in the theater going like this, and on the way home, I stopped at the Tower Record Store, and and got the, the Harder They Come soundtrack. And those yeah, that one what a, what a two days, nice. right? That's quite the yeah, It just it wow. changed my, changed my life forever, and uh, it's been on a reggae trot ever since June of 1953. So yeah, yeah this is my 50th anniversary. Oh, no, no not 53, 1973, right? What did I say, 53? Yes. Uh huh. Uh, no, 73. Yeah, I, I, I do remember 53 very well. I'm, <laughs> I'm 80, and I'm first generation <laughs> rock and roll. I yeah, grew up so in Alan Freed in New York City. 1953, I, I was picking him up from Cleveland on WJW, oh my which was carried on a black station in Newark, New Jersey. I grew up in New York. And then the following year, he came to New York City. And what a voice. And, and he just put so much passion into his records. And now it's time for some cheek to cheek dancing as the platters sing the great pretender. And, and then he was on from seven to 10. And I used to have to listen under the covers because my parents wanted me to go to bed on school nights. But, and, and the radios then had a light on the dial, you know, and that would be 
seen underneath right. the crack of my door. So Alan Freed under the covers. And then 10 to Midnight, an even blacker version of Alan Freed, Jocko Henderson on WADO Radio, 1280 on your dial. And he had a rap that every kid, black, white, Hispanic in New York knew. Away up here in the stratosphere, you gotta holler loud and clear. A e tiddly uck. Oh, this is the jock and I'm back on the scene with my record machine saying ooh pop a do and how do you do? Ready for your race into <laughs> outer space? Ooh, 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 all through later gator got a cut. Nice, nice. Well that yeah, I mean you had you had a whole a whole life yeah. and career before your reggae baptism. Like, That's incredible. It? Yeah. yeah, but when my first radio show was on WVOX, which later became a Caribbean station back in New York. Yeah, I did not know you were on new radio in New York. I was on WVOX in 1961. Oh. I had my own show for two years. My first interview was with Ola Tunji. Oh, my God. Baba Tunde Ola Tunji, Drums of Passion. Yeah. We were friends for the rest of his life. Yeah, so I've always been into, you know, yeah, not that... ordinary music. Right, right, right. Well, so, so you are... You are most known as as the uh, as junior well, many things, well, yeah. well many things but 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 the mm -hmm. wealth of knowledge and, and and collector on on Bob Marley and speaking of which there's some great exciting news right kind of hot off the press if you will Roger why don't you very hot off the press we here with we our listeners and viewers. publicly for the first time tonight um, last Thursday we were all together at the premiere party at Hollywood and Highland for the Bob Marley One Love Experience. Yeah. And the day before, I got uh, an email from the producers saying, could you recommend someone who knows a lot about Bob Marley who could lead our VIP tours? And I basically wrote back and I said, you're looking at him, mother. <laughs> you know, name Roger you know, would you do it? I'm sure I'd do it. So I've been signed up to do uh, two tours on Saturday and two tours on Sunday at one and three o'clock. Wow. And I will guide people through those seven wonderful rooms filled with art and artifacts and memorabilia and tell Bob Marley's life story to them and answer any questions people want. And I've just arranged, I'm really excited about this, um, to have my... Um, latest book i've written seven books about bob but the latest is the summation of my life's work it's called so much things to say the oral history of bob marley and they're going to stock that in the bookstore wow. and it's like the only non marley f oh good man <laughs> have you read it uh i i have to be honest i have not yet however it is next up roger I, I, all I'm right going to read uh, okay but, and then yeah, the I, other I, thing I, that, um, I found a, a case recently of a book that's been out of print for 22 years. Oh, it's the uh, World of Reggae, which is the catalog to my Queen Mary exhibition back in 2001. How yes. horrible that was. They took 6,000 things out of the house and framed them. And the book has about 1,600 illustrations, including this uh, poster mm -hmm. signed by Bob and now yes. 42 of his closest associates. And when I loaned that poster to the Grammy Museum a few years ago for their Marley show, yep. they insured it for $75,000. <laughs> but it's Bob that everybody close to him signed it except Peter Tosh. Okay. Minas signed no blood clot, Bob Marley. <laughs> so, so I got plenty of records signed by so, so just to repeat, you, you're you doing two tours every Saturday and two tours every Sunday. It's the Bob Marley One Love Experience. It's an interactive exhibition at Hollywood and Highland at uh, Ovation Hollywood. Right. Right next door to the Dolby Theater where the Oscars yeah. are about to be held. Nice. And it uh, runs for approximately 12 weeks, right? Uh, yeah, all, uh, till uh -huh. the end of April. So I'm I'm booked every weekend to the end of April with the well, exception of the last week in February. As a teaser, can you tell people what they'll be seeing? Um, an eight foot long spliff, a nine foot in diameter vinyl record. I was thinking it would take like a two pound diamond needle to play it. If you could find a turn, you'd, you'd need a, a merry-go-round for the turntable for it. But you're going to see Mr. Brainwash. If you ever saw Exit Through the Gift Shop, it was partly about Banksy and partly about our own Mr. Brainwash, who was there. And gorgeous murals by him and um, a pair of anarchists who were there from London known as the Postmen. 
They did some beautiful, beautiful, just great works of art. There's a, a little private room with a bit of Gil Noble's interview from ABC television in 1980. And Gil was a Jamaican. So Bob really opened up to him. And the excerpt they play is Bob's premonition of the assassination attempt on his life days before he was shot. And it, it just give you chills. And there's a, a couple of rooms where you have earphones uh, that you can dance to music and see all kinds of projections on the walls of performances. And it just goes on and on. It's it's if you're into Marley in any way uh, at, yeah. at any age. The first two tours I did this weekend were uh, with two families of five. Oh, you and started already? I started last Saturday. Yeah. Oh, and, right. Uh, right. Yeah, and and yeah. and it was a Jamaican family. My very first tour was a Jamaican family of five. That felt <laughs> so good. So uh, you know, bring your questions, and I'll yeah. try to answer them. And I'll have two books to, to autograph if you'd like, and they'll be available in the in the gift shop at the end of the tour. But I, I can't I, I, wait. It's it's really an accomplishment, though, for someone you know. Bob Marley grew up with humble and extremely poor beginning to attain oh. that level. I, I, got, I got teary eyed when I walk inside. I said, man, yeah. he lived like what, 20 miles across. I mean, from Manchester, he is from St. Anne's. How yeah. he got here? How did Bob Marley get here? I, I couldn't find the answers. I really yeah. couldn't find, but it's so deep and profound. Yeah. A few years ago, I was interviewed by Phil Kogan who created The Amazing Race. Mm -hmm. And he, he wanted to interview me, he said, because he'd been to 130 <laughs> countries. And in every single country, no matter how remote, how tiny, he found evidence of Bob Marley. Right, right. right. That's well, on YouTube. If you put bucket 21, you'll, you'll find it. A friend of mine from um, the Claremont Colleges went on a sabbatical. And her first stop was France. And every country that she visited for three months, she saw a Bob Marley t-shirt. Yeah. When she got to Brazil, she bought a shirt, of course, when she got to Brazil. There were kids who were literally wanted to take the Bob Marley shirt off her. They loved it so much. Mm -hmm. Every country she went to, including Palestine, the people were wearing yeah. Bob Marley t-shirt. Right. Right. Amazing, 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 amazing. We're getting a great sneak peek there of your uh, part of your ar archives, Roger. This is one of my favorite t-shirts. I've got about 1,500 of them. <laughs> kumbu, kumbu, ya, Bob Marley. Oh, my goodness. From... <clears throat> Zimba, uh, from, uh, where is it here? Zanzibar? Zanzibar. Yeah. Zimbabwe. Zanzibar. A friend of mine walked the length of Zanzibar in uh, 1994. And he came upon, on February 6th, Bob's birthday, he came upon this remote mountain village. And there were 200 people all wearing this shirt. And my friend says, what the hell does Kumbu Kumbu ya Bob Marley mean? And they told him it meant the second coming of Bob Marley. Wow. He's everywhere. Yes, wow. yes, yes. So so Roger, what was what was the first significant piece of Bob Marley memorabilia that you collected, <laughs> whether it's because of value or 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 uh, I, I, it had to it had to be the 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 poster. The poster. I, I saw him first in 75 at the Oakland Paramount, which was one of the great shows of my whole life. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, the way he was on stage and how he looked it was just like an apparition from a, a different universe right um i went to jamaica in 76 couldn't find any of his records at his own record shack and one of the big stars of the music picked my pocket in bob marley's record short shop <laughs> um, <laughs> real introduction to to kingston but it was the middle oh, yeah. of the state of emergency <laughs> and i shouldn't have been there anyway so three years later uh, hank holmes and i started the reggae beat which we'll talk about later yes. um and um yeah. our, we got we got a call from island records bob's label uh this is november of 79 the show had been on the air for about six weeks and they asked if we would <laughs> if we would mind going on the road for two weeks with Bob Marley. <laughs> and um, I had met him the year before in Santa Cruz. I, I'd been Chadwick, you talked to? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. The year before, um, I, I was hired by a couple of Hollywood screenwriters to novelize 
two screenplays. So we lived uh, on a mountaintop in Big Sur for t three months. And uh, Bob was coming to Santa Cruz, which was like maybe an hour and a half north of there. And so we got tickets to both shows in one night at the Santa Cruz Civic. And there's, I don't know if you've ever been in the Santa Cruz Civic, but it's like a high school gym. Yeah. You know, there's bleachers on two sides and in the back. And the stage was only about three feet high. So, I mean, what an intimate way to see Bob Marley. <laughs> And the soundboard was just plopped in the middle of the dance floor. So we were among the first people in. And um, on the on the way into the hall, there was a man handing out posters for a show three nights later in uh, the Greek theater in Berkeley. So I had the poster with me and we come inside and uh, there's a guy at the soundboard and next to him, there's a tall, light-skinned black man with little nubber dreads just starting to sprout. I figured he had something to do with the band. So I went up and I said, pardon me, sir. Are you going to do Waiting in Vain tonight? And he looked at me kind of funny and he says, why? And I said, oh, that's my favorite Bob Marley song, especially that incredible lead guitar line that Junior Marvin plays. And he said, do you want to meet Bob? <laughs> I mean, just that fast. <laughs> I went, <laughs> yeah <laughs> can i bring my wife and he said sure so he takes mary and me down this long corridor to go backstage and he says what's your name and i said well, i'm roger this is my wife mary he says hi i'm junior marvin <laughs> I, mean, what is I said it? the right thing to the right guy at the right time right? yeah but we go in the back room and the whole band is in there and they have these big cafeteria tables, four of them pushed together to make a gigantic table. And everybody's sitting this far away from each other and they all have a mound of herb in front of them <laughs> and a pack of individual rolling papers and nobody's saying anything to anybody. Everyone's like a convention of zombies. And so Junior sees my poster and he says, why don't you ask Bob to sign your poster? I go, oh, right. <laughs> So, I mean, I was just awestruck. And, and so he takes me around the other side of the table and Bob is there and he's <laughs> way down in the seat and his eyes are blood red. And uh, how do you Jamaicans say it? In a da ites? <laughs> ites. He was in a da ites. <laughs> and I, I said, Bob, are, are you <laughs> going to do Waiting in Vain tonight? And he kind of looks up at me and he goes, uh, maybe. <laughs> but I found out, you know, he virtually yeah. never, did that song live because uh, uh, Rita and Judy wouldn't sing it because they thought it was about Cindy Breakspear. Oh, okay. But it actually wasn't, and it wasn't even written by Bob. It was written by Tyrone Downey oh. years earlier. Yeah. So, but you know, one of the greatest other <laughs> songs of all time, according to Lytton Fuzzy Johnson, who wrote the intro for my oral history book. <laughs> That's a fair, but it is. And he well. never played it live. Wow. Interesting. What a, shame, what a waste. So yeah. I had met him, but I didn't really know him till the following year. And we got to be on the road with him for two weeks and do all kinds of incredible things. But wow. I think what we're here tonight to talk about is the birth of the reggae scene in L.A., right? Uh -huh. Well, also yeah. want to ask you, uh, I know that you have the world's largest collection of Bob Marley memorabilia and other reggae related items showcased throughout your home. Can you tell us about that before we jump into the scene uh, because it's all interrelated and connected yeah well I, I, that article in rolling stone was the beginning of what is now known as roger stephan's reggae archives it was never called that until timothy white's book catch a fire when he talked about how much he had relied on roger stephan's and hank holmes reggae archives yeah. um, everything i came in contact with from that day forward uh, about Rasta, about Ethiopia, about Haile Selassie, about Jamaican culture and politics, anything to do with ska, rocksteady, reggae, DJ. Uh, it went into ever-increasing folders and drawers. Now I've got, I think, 140 cubic feet of alphabetized clippings. Our dear friend, Native Wayne, gave me eight cartons of 30 years of his collection of Jamaican newspaper clippings. Wow. And it took me two months to sort them and alphabetically file them. So that was last year, a huge, significant addition to the archives. Um, there's 1500 t-shirts, there's about three or 4,000 buttons, badges, there's sculptures, mm -hmm. there's paintings, there's, 
Um, uh, right to my right is a hand-painted beaded curtain of Chinese Bob from Saigon. And I spent the last 26 months of the 60s in the army in Saigon. So that has a, many levels of meaning for me. Bob's got Chinese eyes, yellow skin, and Mandarin fingernails. I remember I seeing mean, that one. Local, <laughs> you know, local cultures love seeing Bob as part of their own. Uh, there's another one uh, that's more uh, Bob-like that go, is the entrance to the reggae library. Um, 2,000 hours of video, 14,000 hours of, of cassettes, which is still the principal way I listen to the music. Um, 3,000 books and magazines from all over the world. Um, I'm, I'm leaving a lot of stuff out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. well, we've had to move twice just to house the collections. 6,000 uh, things were on display and framed at the Queen Mary, and they've been in storage for 21 years now, 22 years. Um, the rumor has it that you're going to sell it to Jamaica. I did. I didn't sell it to Jamaica. I going sold it. To, you're going to. I, so, uh, I have sold it already to Joe Bogdanovich, who I knew 40 years ago. He was a big fan of the Reggae Beat Show when he lived in oh, L.A. Oh, oh. And, uh, and, he, and where is he based? He's based in Jamaica. He just loves Jamaica. He's the heir to the Starkist tuna fortune. Oh. And he, when he's, his grandpa died and left him a lot of money, he decided to invest it in Jamaica. And he bought Sting and cleaned it up. Mm. No more homophobia, no more gun lyrics, Amen. no more cursing. And then he What's bought... Name again? Uh, uh, Joe Bogdanovich. Uh, his uh, cousin, Peter Bogdanovich, was a famous Hollywood director. Oh, Last yeah. Picture Show and things okay. like that. Yes. So uh, Joe... Um, four years ago, actually, made the offer. And it all hinges on the purchase of land in Montego Bay, uh, where the Sumfest Festival, which he also owns, is held. And they've been dragging the contractual negotiations for the lease. It's into its fourth year now. And he feels it's very, very close. Okay. And once once we sign that, we go full speed into design uh, building and I want to. Although I'm I'm 80, I want to be there for the opening day when they open the lock. And it's going to be a museum of reggae culture. Yes, nice. it's going to celebrate all the great artists. It's not going to be just Bob. Uh, it's going to be all the original Whalers: uh, Cherry Green, Beverly Kelso, um, uh, Junior Braithwaite, Vision Walker. They were all Whalers. Yes, yes. They're going to be there. But so is uh, Roy Shirley. So is Alton Ellis. So is Bob Andy. Right. So is Laurel Aitken. You know, it's going to go back to the mm -hmm. earliest stages of of the music. Show each of the 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 eras, yeah. and there'll be. Uh, you know, in in the Queen Mary show, did either of you see the Queen Mary show? Oh yes, 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 yes. In, in yes. Fact, Roger, oh yes. It, it it also meant the world to me and 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 Ireno, uh, that our reggae nucleus magazine was showcased in there. Yeah. Oh yeah. You were on display. But yes, no. That I I I loved I loved uh, the the museum uh, uh, that you had down there. Uh, what, no, what, I mean there were 144 album covers of Bob Marley. Uh, there were all the singles he ever did uh, up until um, up until two thousand on on those uh, yeah uh, what what do you call them they were they were stanchions yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. four sided stanchions right, he had right, hundred right. singles and many uh, almost all my records are autographed so you you're going to see you're going to be able to see tactily the, the history of the music and lots of photographs uh, lots of paintings um the buttons the flyers the the schomburg institute in new york back in 1987 when i left the reggae beat uh, tried to buy my archives that was the first time someone wanted them and howard dodson the director of it in harlem uh, came out and uh, he he told me of the value to historians of the ephemera. So in these cabinets behind me here, there's 30,000 flyers from all over the world. And I want to have a room like your garage there. <laughs> okay, nothing but thousands of flyers oh, in yeah. every language you can imagine. Right. It's going to be so overwhelming that you got to go back three or four times. To yeah, love that. yeah, I want to put in an application for a job there. <laughs> Maybe you could be a guide. You'd be a great guide. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. I love that. So, so, um, so Roger, yes, we, 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 we want to talk about the, the early scene here in Southern California. So, so, so you referenced when you had the, um, 
uh, when the lightning bolt went off, so to speak, and you were baptized, right? Um, yeah. hearing, hearing Bob, <laughs> the harder they come. So, so after that, did you, how soon after that were you really immersed in, in, and became such a huge? Well, you know, reggae. Berkeley was one of the first hotbeds for reggae in America. Yes. Berkeley, Boston. And um, there were, there were so many people who collected the music early on up there. And I lived in Berkeley uh, in the hills, a couple of blocks above uh, Tower Records and, and uh, Rasputin's and uh, uh, what eventually became Amoeba. And, and they all carried British pressings. They would carry the Trojan uh, albums. So I learned very quickly that not all reggae was that good. Because there, so, <laughs> there was so much crap <laughs> on those Trojan albums. Uh, but there were usually two or three really classic songs, enough to make me try to find some place where I could get the more authentic stuff. And that was at Ruel Mills, Trench Town Records on Fillmore Street. He was an old spar of Bob's and he was getting the, the records directly from Kingston. He didn't have a lot, but he had... Ross Michael and the Sons of Negus in 1973. He had Count Ossie and the Mystic Revelation of Rastafari. And he had, a, a, you know, Dr. Ali deep Montano. Roots. Hmm? Deep roots. Oh, deep, deep, deep. Plus, he sold herb out of the back room. So <laughs> we, Doug went and Lance Linares and I, we, we white acolytes uh, once he realized we weren't FBI men right. <laughs> would allow us into the back room and there he'd play his personal stash of music. So my first teacher was was Ruel Mills and I, wow. I credit him in, in the oral history for, right. for turning so many of us on who became reggae DJs. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug Went was the earliest uh, I knew. He, he was on KTIM in Marin County so he could be picked up all over the bay. Uh, and he refused to do a reggae show on a non-commercial station. He says, this is not non-commercial music. This should be played right up there with all the San Francisco groups and all the Philly soul groups. This is great music. And we're going to stay here on a commercial station and give it the exposure it needs, even though they had a tiny wattage. But um, he succeeded? ended up working for two or three other commercial radio stations, wow. bigger stations in San Francisco. Playing and reggae music. Got a website. Pardon? Playing reggae music. Strictly reggae. And he, he was a huge ska fan and he loved Lee Perry. He became one of the world's Lee Perry experts. Had him on his show many times. Doug went, my my yeah. dear, dear brother. Yes, I used to listen to him when he visited you on KCRW. Which right. Leads to the next question. They uh you work with Hank Combs, I think you guys, back in nineteen seventy nine. Nineteen seventy nine. The reggae beat. Tell us about that to bring up to speed. Well, now, now we get into what was the scene like in the 70s in, in L.A. Yeah. Uh, there, there was very little reggae uh, and none on an, on an L.A. station. There was a, a woman with a Ph.D. Uh, out in, um, uh, in the Redlands, and uh, she called herself uh, Collie, uh, Collie Dolly. <laughs> and she was a girlfriend of Larry McDonald's, the great percussionist. So she had him on her show all the time, telling the history of the music. I'm talking about 1976, 77. Wow. We couldn't pick her up in town here, but out in the IE, you, you could hear wow. Collie Dolly. Um, Sandy Jules had a show on KCRW. It was a Caribbean show. And uh, he played a little reggae, but he was a Trini. So he was always in into uh, calypso, calypso. You know, calypso uh, more than anything else but he did play some reggae um hank and i met through barton's records barton's was the place for uh, an meeting spot <laughs> Uh, Bali and his wife Yvonne they had two stores in 1979 one was in the community down in the Santa Barbara shopping center mm -hmm. uh, in Crenshaw and uh, that was the main uh, Barton's record but uh, there was one uptown on La Brea on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard uh, directly opposite where the statue of the four silver women is on Hollywood Boulevard at the end of the yeah. boulevard and that's where Bob Marley's star is ironically uh, I didn't know Martin had a store up there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah Yvonne so and I was in there one day in 1978, and I met a man named Josh Harris, who was a drummer up north originally for the Titans, um, a ska reggae band. 
and then had joined the upset her uh, the um untouchables no um it begins with a u um i'll think of it in a second uh untouchables yes 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 the untouchables he was the drummer for the untouchables and we hit it off and we were talking about records and he says oh you're really into it i said yeah i went to jamaica in 76 <laughs> i couldn't find any bob marley records in bob marley's record store <laughs> I, I went all over the island looking for dadawa which had just come out couldn't find a copy in four, 12 of the 14 parishes nobody had dadawa went back to Trenchtown records he had three copies and so we, we kidded about how hard it was to find the music. And he says, well, last week I was in here and I met a guy named Hank Holmes and he invited me to his house and he sells records out of there. He has a mail order company called Reggae Beat and he's got about 8,000 Jamaican records, but he's never left LA in his life. I said, you got to give me this cat's number, man. <laughs> so he did. And I called him as soon as I got home. And what year he, was that again, Roger? What year? Eh. 78. And he had that many, he had that many incredible. Well, I'll tell you the story. So he's um, he's got this huge collection. I call him up and I go over and he was so impressed that I'd been to Jamaica and that I had a copy of the Ethiopians album, which had Hong Kong flu on it. And he'd yeah. been looking for that for a couple of years, evidently. So we became instant friends and he, he loaned me all these early pressings on British labels of Bob Marley's music. And I thought, you know, I just met this guy and he's trusting me with this incredibly rare stuff. And I brought my records over to his place so he could tape them. And every Friday night, he would have a, a listening session for potential record buyers. Now, here's, here's the story. How did he do this without ever leaving L.A.? In the back room, there were like orange crates filled with 400 singles in each crate piled to the very ceiling. He hadn't even opened most of them yet. Oh my goodness. So the story goes like this. Back in 78, Hank was working in a one-stop on Pico Boulevard. A one-stop is a, a wholesale retail store. Yeah, yeah, you, you work. I have been there. Oh, yes. I can't watch your vacation. I went there. <laughs> so this store specialized in cutouts, which were records that had too many pressed, the kind of things you'd see for 25 cents in a, in a cutout bin somewhere. Well, this this huge one stop had thousands of soul music cutouts for 25 cents a piece. Now, Hank is so into the music early on that he subscribes to all the British press, NME, Melody Maker, uh, the little thing that uh, Carl Gale had, Jog, Lyman. Um, and in the back of most of those British newsprint music papers, they had little classified ads a lot of them from uh, the Midlands. Mm -hmm. And they were crazy about what they called Northern Soul, right? Yep. Northern Soul was basically American soul music, but they figured Manchester, Birmingham, they were the hippest people in England and they were, <laughs> they were going to call it Northern Soul. It's our music. And they were advertising uh, Northern Soul albums for 10 pounds each because they were so rare in England. And you begin to get the picture. Yes. Hank also sees ads from these very same stores for 10 reggae singles for one pound. Our choice. So you might get three copies in a bundle of Dr. Ali Montado doing Best Dressed Chicken in Town on yellow vinyl, right? right. So he calls the this guy up in one particular store and he says, I have X, Y, and Z soul albums and they're worth 10 pounds a piece, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'll give you 10 pounds. Sure. So Hank says, well, I've seen your ad for 10 reggae singles for a pound. So for every Northern Soul album I send you, will you send me 100 reggae singles? And the guy agreed to it. <laughs> and that's how he had these boxes. I don't know if before he died, if he ever opened the last one. There were so many records. So the deal was you'd go over if you were lucky enough to get an invitation on Friday nights. He lived right off Television City on Ogden off uh, Beverly Boulevard in Fairfax. And you'd go up to his second story apartment in this fourplex he lived in. And you'd sit around a big dining room table with people like Chuck Foster and uh, Matt Dinsmore and uh, uh, a lot of lot of people who went on to build huge collections, thanks to, thanks to Hank. And he would pull out a record, and there might be seven copies. And let's let's stay with the best dressed chicken metaphor. 
So he had to play each copy to find the best copy. And often the best A side had a crummy B side. So he'd have to find the best B side too. And when he finally got that, they would be put aside. Then he had to find the next best because that, those are the ones he'd play. Right, right. And there might be two left at the end of the evening after we'd listened to it like 14 times. We knew every word of every song. <laughs> And and those would be available and we'd fight over who would get it if there were limited copies. And in the course of an evening, we might listen to three or four records. <laughs> but the herb was fine. There was a lot of good beer. And, and he was teaching us. I can't tell you how funny a guy Hank Holmes was. He never showed it on the air. And that drove me nuts. You'd go to his house on Friday night and your your sides would hurt from laughing when you got home. And he had all this information. He knew the backstory of every artist you could possibly think of. I went there with a single I bought at uh, Trenchtown Records years earlier by well pleased and satisfied and i said hank have you ever heard of these guys he pulled six records out <laughs> well pleased and satisfied and so i said man you know i've been in radio on and off since 1961 there's no freaking reggae radio we could do an incredible reggae show oh my god no i'm I don't want to, I don't want to be in public. I don't want to talk. I, I'm no good at that. I'm, I said, well, you know, I am. I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll be the ploy. I'll, I'll ask you a question. You can, you can tell your information that way. Oh, all right. So we tried for a whole year. First, we went to every commercial station. There was uh, Dr. Demento. Let me go on the air and play three reggae songs. Uh -huh. Um, Ram Goat Liver was one of them. He liked that because it was about a bus accident and all the passengers get out after they kill the Ram Goat and eat him. Um, and um, nobody wanted nobody wanted to give us a, a shot, not even on a Sunday morning. Um, then we went to the most obvious station of all. If we weren't going to get on a commercial station, we went to KPFK. You know, very left wing, very. Uh, revolutionary and that's what reggae is all about for god's sake and we did three sample shows with three different djs there and we got very nice response from the listeners they were kind of like audition shows and um we got a call from the white woman who was running the station at that time in the fall of 1979 and we went down to the station fully expecting to get our time slot we were so excited and we walk in her office and she said well you know uh, you sound okay on the radio, but this is KPFK, and we we really can't, in good conscience, put you guys on the air because you're white, playing black music. Mm -hmm. So, in absolute desperation, after a year of no, 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 Harry Zeitlin, a jazz aficionado who had a late night show on KCRW introduced us to Tom Schnabel who had just taken over as the music director of KCRW An amazing and, guy. Yeah. and he um, he uh, Sandy Jules was going out of town for three weeks so he let us sit in for Sandy Jules as kind of a test show and they liked it so much they gave us our own show on Sundays from noon to two um, and uh, in the first fun drive, um, they gave us an extra hour for three hours to pitch, you know, those damn endless fun drives. <laughs> the previous 10 day fun drive had made only $40,000. Our three hour show made $10,500 in one, one sitting. Oh. Ruth. Ruth Hirschman, the manager of the station, came running down before we were off the air. She says, from now on, you're a four-hour show on Sunday afternoons. I've never seen anything like this. This is incredible. And we became the biggest fundraiser in the history of KCRW. I talked to Tom Schnabel recently, and he says, you, are you aware that you made over $2 million on the reggae beat for that station? When we went there, it was a junior high school classroom. Yeah. It was smaller than the room i'm sitting in and everything was there the office this on the air studio a little interview room and a transmitter in this place the size of a small dining room and it had 110 watts 
and the signal hit the 405 and died. And uh, it had great plans for growth. And because of all the money that, uh, in part because of the money we raised, they were able to move within two years onto the campus of Santa Monica City College and have a huge live music room, which we took full advantage of. And uh, it became the most popular non-commercial radio show in LA, uh, according to the LA Weekly. And one Sunday we tested it. Um, a friend of ours offered to go out on the cliff above the Santa Monica Pier. And we told people, because um, we heard there are a lot of people on the beach who listened. So uh, we said at two o'clock today, we're going to ask everyone on the beach in Santa Monica who's listening to the reggae beat to stand up and wave. And we'd have somebody on the cliff watching. The guy came racing back to the station and he says, everybody on the beach stood up. Everybody stood up. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so great. Wait, so, so, so Roger, you, so you and Hank uh, hosted it for uh, until what year, and then, and then Chuck. I left in '87. Chuck Foster succeeded me. We each had exactly seven and a half years with Hank. The only time Hank and Chuck and I were all on the air together was on the 15th anniversary show, and Ruth fired them four days later. Yeah. So by then you had left. I left the show in 87 because I'd played everything I wanted to play at least three times. Right. Hank wouldn't talk about anything. That's what drove me freaking nuts with Hank. Um, he used to tell stories about um, um, a singer in, in Yabby Yu's group in The Prophets. Oh, I got to think of this fellow's name. Uh, it'll come to me. Um and he had a unique voice, and um, he played the record on show number 10. I was just listening to the air check the other day. So um, when the record ended, uh, I said, uh, so Hank, tell tell people that great story about, you know, Ja, whoever. And um, Hank goes, that's not such a great story. <laughs> I said, well, uh, why why don't you tell it and let the listeners decide? Right, right, right. I can't ever remember his name. Odd name. Uh, but the deal was this guy had been in, in the ghetto wars and he had been shot through the throat and lived. Survived. And it gave his voice a real different pitch that he'd oh. never heard before. So, yeah, but you hired him to be a prophet. And so Hank tells that story and uh, ends it by saying, that's not such a great story. <laughs> Additionally, you also had a stint on television, right? Uh, LA television program. L L the LA reggae. And right? My vision was I would just be the, the stooge. I'd, I'd be the, the guy who sets Hank up to share all this knowledge. And it turns out he, he was afraid somebody else would get the record. I mean, I'd, I'd uh, tape a record at his house and all of a sudden he'd lift the needle and then drop it back down or start it late so he had the only perfect copy. And he did the same thing on, did the, same thing on the air, too. If you listen back to those air checks, there's you know, a little click of the... Uh, so what was his fear? That people would tape the record and make a copy? He yeah, Well, he, he would let me tape a lot of his records so I could play them in my sets. and um, but But they were never perfect. Hmm. They were never perfect. He he was afraid somebody else would get right. a good copy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> which it, drove me nuts, you know. So all of a sudden, I realized I had to be the voice. I so I had to do all the interviews, and I had to do all the new music because he didn't like any of the new music. Right. Uh, he hated Third World. He poisoned me against ter Third World. I always want to apologize to uh, Cat Coor for that. Uh, Although Cat Coor in the Third World locked me in the uh, closet at the Country Club in 1981, that's another music for, for punishment because I wasn't playing their music. Yeah. Oh no! Oh no! I came to get him backstage uh, for the encore, and they threw me in the broom closet. I'm I'm glad I'm glad, I still I'm, laugh glad at that you out. I'm glad you're not still in there. Um, but, I am too. <laughs> the the LA Reggae um, Television Program. Yeah. Chili Charles and uh, Mike Borman and his wife Seal. Uh, what Chilly what time period Bay. was that? Say again. What era? Okay, um, we're talking 1984. Where Chili had already started the show, 
on Theta Cable. This is a, something else I found out today, oh, okay. which became Westinghouse, which became Century, and then got gobbled up by somebody else. But we were on there for 23 years. Chili Charles was a brilliant drummer who lived for a long time in England, played on a lot of the early 70s psychedelic music, came to uh, L.A., and um, he and Mike and Seal Borman uh, started uh, L.A. Reggae, and he he asked if he could come down to the station and film some of my interviews, and that's how our link up started. And I he asked me to become the host of the show, and uh, that went on twenty twenty three years before he passed away in uh, Hawaii in two thousand four. And, and Chili, the father of Oliver Charles, yeah, his son is famous drummer. See. Oliver Charles' dad, yeah. yeah. Yes. So Ben Harper's drummer, as my right. Father. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know should have yep. loved it. Yeah. 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 Innocent criminals, yeah. Yes, mm. yes. So, so, um, and then the Beat Magazine. Well, we're jumping ahead of things. All um, right. Let, let's go back because I because I know that you found some incredible or you made some notes based on a previous interview. So I think this is going to be really fascinating. Do you remember BAM magazine, the Bay Area? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they were originally up in San Francisco and then they have a, an yeah. edition published in LA, BAM. Right. So, and the tape doesn't have this fellow's name on it who interviewed me. I could, I could dig through piles and find the actual interview, but I didn't have time for that. So anyhow, this guy interviews me. He wanted to do a history of reggae in California. Okay. And I was the one chosen to give him the L.A. history. Okay. And what, was, year, what year was this? This would have been the second week of October 1981. Oh, after really? Bob okay. died, when they had that incredible all-star concert out at the country club with the Whalers Band, Freddie McGregor, Joe Higgs, wow. with, uh, Marcia and Judy. Okay. Uh, amazing uh, two nights out there. And but we'll 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 get to that in a bit. So um, these are some of the notes I, I made about the earliest times. Yes. Um, we we had we we talked about Barton's down in the Buckingham uh, Shopping Center in Santa Barbara, uh, Santa Barbara Shopping Center, Buckingham Street, um, and um, <laughs> they they the store down in in uh, Crenshaw lasted for a long time until uh, one evening um, Ken Booth and Carl Dawkins were put on at the Consolidated Realty Plaza by uh, our, our friend Ron Miller, who lost his shirt and took him years to pay it off. Mm -hmm. um, and on the way home, uh, Bally Barton sees flames coming from somewhere and he drives over to see what's happening and it's his store burning to the ground. Mm -hmm. So he had to rebuild Barton's records. Um, in those early days, you can find reggae occasionally on a harbor cruise, right. and uh, yeah. that was uh, ska on one deck and soca on the other. Uh -huh. uh, Tony G actually had one of the earliest reggae shows on KMAX. It only lasted for a couple of months, and it, um, Tony had a store uh, called Tough Gong. Tony was the announcer on the first live album by the Whalers, the one at the Lyceum in 75. And uh, he was the MC and, and road manager for Bob for years. And Bob set him up uh, to be the West Coast distributor for Tough Gong and other Jamaican uh, uh, labels. And I, I, Hank and I both got a lot of really good stuff from, from him. So he, he had a show, but it, it disappeared. Um, from 75 to 80, Sandy Jules had a show of Caribbean music, first on K-Max and then on, on KCRW. Um, Two or three times a year, someone would come through town like Toots or Third World, Inner Circle, um, the Starwood on Santa Monica Boulevard put on a lot of those medium level acts that could draw, you know, four or five hundred people. But for the most part, a couple of shows uh, by Bob at the Roxy over the years. Um, great show that Bob, great show that Bob did in 1978 at the Burbank Starlight Amphitheater when Peter Tosh was signed to the Rolling Stones label. He was opening for them the next day at Anaheim Stadium, and he he in the middle of Bob's encore that night of uh, Get Up Stand Up, he looks up and here comes Peter Tosh striding across stage, grabs the mic just at the same part of the record where he sings wow. sick and tired of this BS game. And there's pictures of Bob just leaping in the air with the biggest smile I've ever seen. We were and there. That was that the first time in, in a while that they had been. 
That was the only time, only time. after only the time. Whalers broke up only that time. they appeared oh, abroad yeah. together ever. Wow, what a special night. And that. afterwards, we we saw Peter coming out of the, the backstage, and I went up and I said, you know, a lot of us are going to Anaheim tomorrow not to see the Rolling Stones. We're going to see you, so be aware <laughs> that, you know, you're going to have fans out there. And uh, the following year, I had him on the television uh, show, and Hank and I were talking about that night, and I said, well, what do you remember after the show was over? And Peter says, well, remember me go backstage that night and Bob clapped my hand. No, me clap Bob's hand and him say, why the Pope feel that one? <laughs> and Peter looks into the camera and says, and three days later, the Pope died. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Peter, Peter was, I'm not even sure that's true, but it, it was a great line. And then you got our friend Ron Miller. I mean, you can't say enough great things about about Ron Miller. He was a pioneer in every way. His father ran jukeboxes in the 50s and 60s. So he grew up in that milieu mm -hmm. and he loved reggae and he started his own sound system. Um, and he, he first started playing regularly at a place called Digby's um, every Sunday night. And uh, that went into... Um, a sound system he did with uh, Neville Chung, a Chinese Jamaica, Jamaican uh, called Irie Sounds International. And he had two years at Slauson and Overhill at the 20 Grand Club. You remember the 20 Grand? Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Higgs played there and uh, oh, wow. Larry McDonald, a lot of great people. And, and yeah. that was kind of in the community. So he, he attracted a lot of black Americans and turned them on to reggae for the first time. Um, the um, the crowd at, at 20 grand, according to Ron, was about thirds, a, a third of African-American local people, neighbors of the club, a third Jamaicans and a third white reggae fans. And um, it, it was just a, a really great, yeah. small but great venue. People like Brian Eno and uh, um, Robert Tripp. Fripp, Robert Fripp would come there. Uh, we often saw uh, Jackson Brown. He was a huge reggae fan in those oh. days when he was living with uh, Daryl Hannah. He'd bring her. And uh, it, it just felt right. There, there was no trouble. The, the races were mixing beautifully. Everybody was anxious to learn about this new music. Yep. And yep. to be able to see an actual Jamaican star in person, that was such a rare thing in those days. Um, we had a lot of local DJs, oh, Ja Mikey, Ja Bunny, Ja T. They all toasted live over sound systems. Wow. Um, in 81, Tosh did six shows at the, um, uh, the Roxy, and Ron Miller was his opening act with his sound <laughs> system. Six show? Peter Tosh was that big? Peter Tosh did six shows at the Roxy, two, two a night. Yeah. Nice. And... Um, Let's see. Um, then Ron started working at a place called the Cash Club on North Cahuenga. Okay. Uh, it wasn't just reggae. It was uh, punk and Zydeco and New Wave. Yep. And then Al's Bar, the famous Al's Bar on Thursday nights where Governor Brown would bring Linda <laughs> Ronstadt to hear reggae music. This is all in the late 70s, early 80s in L.A. Uh, DJ Southman, DJ Rastaman, they... They both had sound systems that played a lot of private parties for Jamaican people. Um, L.A. was five or six years behind San Francisco. All these kinds of things were going on in San Francisco as early as 1973 and 74. There was a considerable uh, overseas Jamaican population in Oakland at the time. Oh, in fact, Vision okay. Walker, one of the original whalers who wow. succeeded Bob when Bob went to Delaware, uh, Rita's cousin, he lived there and he was part of the Rastafarians, Haile Selassie's great band, Haile, no, uh, Haile Maskel. Right, right. Um, so it wasn't until, you know, 79 uh, that uh, there was any real sustainable radio on uh, reggae radio. There were 80 stations in LA and not one of them was playing reggae. So we started our show up in San Francisco in the mid seventies, there were two or three reggae shows a day, seven days a week. Uh, you could find radio all over the place, uh, KPU, uh, KPFA, KTIM, and eventually uh, the commercial stations in in San Francisco itself. Um, 
Let me see. Roger, going back to to LA in the early eighties, um, the On Club. That, that oh, was... we're getting we're getting to the On okay, Club. Okay, that requires okay. On Club. Right. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, there, there were there were a lot of collectors um, who uh, specialized in in taping live shows. Uh, if you could hear a board tape of a show, it bore no resemblance to what you were hearing live in the club. I remember uh, one of the Peter Tosh shows at the Roxy. Um, the uh, the mixer had turned the uh, the bass off because it was so loud in the room. He didn't need to put it into the mix at all, and uh, that that says a lot about reggae music because of right. course it's, it's the lead instrument in it. So people like Ever Ready Eddie, who was really close to uh, Keith Richards, he would tape almost every live show that happened in town. But my, I think my, maybe my favorite taper was uh, Jeff Cooper, who ended up uh, opening a, a record store in Burbank called D.B. Cooper's. But Jeff, for a long time, was the chief audio engineer for... Um, uh, NBC television in Burbank and he was a reggae freak and every year he would come to Sunsplash from 1982 to 1988 and he would borrow $10,000 worth of NBC's most precious sound equipment and bring it down to Montego Bay and oh sit God. in the sand directly in front of the mixing board and he had these 10 foot towers and he put these microphones on it and he lived there for four days and nights he never left the site and he made these exquisite tapes so when he passed away he left me his reggae archives wow. and it included eight years of every note sung or spoken at sunsplash from wow. 82 to 88 and they're there they'll go into the museum of course what a credible uh, an amazing messing. amazing uh art, art archive he left you yeah, yeah. And and every year uh, he would do two four-hour specials. We'd devote two hours to each night of Sunsplash with all the, the highlights of it. And he'd talk about what he remembered and what I remembered. And those those were very, very special shows. A yeah. lot of people taped those shows. Usually in, in, in August, he'd, he'd come back and he'd spend a, a month taping everything perfectly and editing it. And I mean, he was a sound engineer. So it, it was another way that that the volunteers uh, in in reggae were all volunteers. I mean, if you're into reggae for money, you don't know what the hell's going on. Um, so CC Smith came aboard in eighty. Uh, we met her in eighty one at Sunsplash, and she came down to the station and said, "You guys can't live like this. You need somebody to straighten this out." And she answered our phones and she started a calendar of events. What few there were. And before we knew it, the calendar was taking 10, 12, 15 minutes of the of the show for all the things that were happening in L.A. We put bands together. We found jobs for musicians. It was, you know, what do you say? You know, and we never asked a penny from anybody. We never said like some of the other reggae disc jockeys on the air in this town in the 80s. Oh, you can have an announcement about your show next weekend, but it's going to cost you money. Right. And if if their stations had ever found that out. They could have lost their license from the yeah, FCC. Sure, 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 so, sure. you know, we never asked anybody or took a penny from anybody. It, it, it's, a, it's a community, you know, we're trying to help each other. Hmm. Where can you find the records? We'll tell you about Jerry down on Wilshire Boulevard, right. uh, uh, stuff like that. So anyhow, I'm, I'm going on here. Um, we had um, uh, groups, a lot of groups started to form here. It was wonderful. The Babylon Warriors had been around a long time playing. Like, Caribbean music, but as reggae became more popular, they got deeper and and deeper in, into the music and became one of the prime groups here. They originally had two women singing with them. Um, Idrin, uh, Rebel Rockers down in, uh, in Laguna Beach uh, with uh, Rasta Red and Princess Morton. They, they, they were together for ages and, and did wonders in the Orange County area. Right. Uh, uh, let's see... They they actually were featured in a uh, Rebel Rockers were featured in a movie with Richard Dreyfus called Whose Life Is It Anyway? You remember oh, that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, now the On Club, Howard Parr. Yes. Uh, Thirty seven hundred block of Sunset, just around the corner, practically from where I'm talking to you now. Uh, that was a mainly ska punk. Uh, reggae club but a lot of ska and it was a tiny room it was like a, a double garage 
And eventually the neighbors complained about the noise and they had to close it up. And the succeeding place was called Los Transvestitos. <laughs> <laughs> True. The Friends Band with Larry <laughs> Fulcher and Peter Dobson from England. Um, they they were really, really good. Um, and, and they had uh, Joe Sample played with them on their first album, The Friends Band. And of course, Jack Miller was part of that. Jack Miller was a major figure in the music. Yes. Uh, the first piece I ever wrote for the LA Weekly was about the uh, dreadlock surfer, Jack Surfing Jack Miller, who had been to Jamaica in 1978 and made an album with the Soul Syndicate, the Mighty Diamonds, Judy Moat, Marcia Griffiths, uh, Third World, and just wow. you know had a great feel for a kind of rock reggae music and was a an early pioneer in 1980. One, he and I arranged a thing at the Berwyn Center, which later became Island Records headquarters when I worked for Island. Okay. And um, he he threw a reggae forum with Sky High, Ross Michael, and Burning Spear, and uh, John Snowden, the writer from the uh, uh, L.A. Times, uh, to, to introduce media in L.A. to the concept of reggae and who were some of the major figures and here's your chance to talk to them okay. and uh, at the end of the evening there was a concert in an empty swimming pool beneath it used to be the the hollywood athletic club where the hollywood stars would stash their mis mistresses for a little lunchtime rendezvous uh, <clears throat> and then it was the island records headquarters too wow. so that 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 was a, a thing that uh, added to the viability of reggae and then the, i think a couple of days later lister hugh and lowe came out from new york who was working at mango records and he did a uh, a, a seminar charged 30 bucks a head for people to come and hear him talk about reggae and that's what we were doing for free every sunday right. that's all right he was a carpet bagger but we let it go <laughs> uh barbara page barbara page made an album yes yes a, a brilliant right. album on epiphany which was uh, warren smith's uh, yeah. label warren smith gave me my first reggae writing job he had a newsprint uh, paper called the reggae news and we interviewed uh, peter tosh for that and got in a little trouble but that's a whole different story big respect uh, for the late warren smith i know he's so, a yes yeah so Jack Miller made a, a great impression. He played all over Southern California and did everything he could to alert people to the power of the music. Right. Um, and then, um, then we started with um, Milt Wilson. Milt Wilson was an early promoter. He had been a scientist with NASA. In fact, his name is on the moon. His name is inscribed what? in a Excuse piece me. of the moon lander that was left on the moon. And I, I guess he had a patent and made a lot of money on it. And he invested it in reggae and African music at the music machine primarily. Yes. Yeah. And uh, there were there were great concerts there with, with uh, all kinds of people from all over Africa and all the major reggae names oh. played at the music machine for years. We, we can't forget him. It was uh, deepness. It was the place for reggae. Oh, it was. For years, it was the place for reggae. Yeah, yeah. And we started the um, Los Angeles uh, Reggae Festival in the, um, not the, was it the, yeah, in the Palladium. For about three years, we, we had it there. Augustus Pablo played and uh, Chinna Smith. I, I will never forget um, Jackie Me Too. He had a piano on rollers. And as he played the piano, he pushed the piano all over the stage as, as, as oh, if he were oh. dancing with it. And never and missed. What time period? What time period? If you 83. Can... Oh, 82, oh, 83. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and nice. then, you know, we had we had half the Soul Syndicate in town, Philly Fullwood, Tony right. Chin, Tenor Grant, Santa Davis. Um, and uh, the I told you about the cable TV show. Um, and, and then and... cassettes. Cassettes were the greatest in, instrument of the 20th century, the yes. greatest invention. Uh, it was oral Sammy's dat. Uh, it's, it's what the Ayatollah uh, infiltrated Iran with. They, they sent cassettes of his sermons all over and over through the, the Shah. I almost said the Shah. <laughs> and, uh, and to me, 
you know, I'm sitting in front of 14,000 hours of, of cassettes uh, from all over the world. And, and that's how Doug went and, and Lance Linares up at Cusp in Santa Cruz. And I would share all the music that we would get. The pressings, as you well know better than anybody, Junior, were so small. Oh, yes. If you mm -hmm. didn't collect on tape, you were going to miss 80, 90% of the great yeah, music. It was the only way to hear the music. The only way to hear it. And yes. I still play them every day. They, they hold up so well. And, and they're, you know, they sound well, good. You can hear the bass. Roger, you, you touched on how Toots would, would tour. And you mentioned, obviously, Bob and, and Peter. Um, during, during late 70s and the 80s, did you see Scatolites or did you see Justin Hines or any of this, Alton Ellis, any of the Scott Rock City legends pass through? Alton Ellis uh, didn't uh, come through until uh, 83. Okay. Uh, his 25th anniversary in the music. And he was in town for six weeks. And uh, it began with a four hour special devoted to all his music. And uh, a lot of the local music stars came to the studio to pay homage to him and tell him how important he was. And then every week after that, he would come down to the station and we would just stop what we were doing, turn it over to him. He did some live singing. I think my favorite time was in, I think it was January of, of 84. He uh, was on a West Coast tour with Bob Andy. And Alton talking about Cox and Don, one of his earliest producers, he was just that SOB, that thieving scumbag, that awful person. And 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 Bob is going, now, now, Alton, I know, you know, you, feel <laughs> you were ripped off, but all of us were ripped off. You know, he gave you a break. He, he, he let your music be known by so many more people than if you'd never been able to record for him. No, man, you can't say that. The man of blood clot thief. We don't love him. Uh, and this went on for the better part of about 15 minutes. So after the show was over, I go out to the parking lot and there's Alton and Bob Andy and they're doubled over with laughter and they're clapping hands. And I go, okay, all right, tell me what. And Bob says, well, Roger Munn, last night we we're on the radio in Oakland and we have this same discussion only is me cursing Coxton and all oh, yeah, yeah. telling me to lay off him and understand what a great guy he is. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that's that's just the the perfect Jamaica story. You know, Jamaicans love to to argue, to reason, and whatever position you take, they're going to take the other position. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> but Alton Alton was great, and Johnny Osborne too. I mean, the Coxon artists, Freddie McGregor, those. Mm -hmm. Came on and all they wanted to do was sing and then when we had, when we had the live music room we could do that we, we had a, a whole hour-long concert from uh, um the horn player from from coxon um oh not randall what's what's his name the, the sax player so a whole bunch of them. i'll oh. think of it in a second um, oh scatolite no, I think he was in the Scatolites too, but but, but he played in all of Coxon's uh, recordings. And his son, Noel, his son, Noel. Oh, uh, uh, Roland? Roland, Roland Alfonso. Alfonso, thank you. Yeah, yeah. My excuse is I'm 80. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Roland Alfonso did a whole hour long live concert for us. Uh -huh. That was really unforgettable. Um, we had a group of Lloyd Hemmings. Lloyd Hemmings came up from Jamaica. He was a star down there, and he came to L.A. to test the, the market, and he became the lead singer of uh, Uprising. Idrin, Larry McDonald played in Idrin. Yeah. Um, so that's page two. Now we get to page <laughs> three. Jati is the new lead singer for Idrin. Third Eye Band, they backed Delroy Wilson and, and Jimmy Riley at the Consolidated Real. They were out here too? They were out here. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, they, they were brought out here by Ron Miller, who oh. uh, cashed in his life savings to put those two shows on yeah, and, right. lost his, and lost his shirt. And for years after, he was paying his debt off. Yeah. Uh, the Ital Roots. Ska Revivalists, the first one of those groups was the Box Boys. Yes. You remember the Box Boys? We, yes, we, we've right. actually interviewed them on it. Yeah. You did? Yeah. yeah. 
Who was the female lead vocalist for them? Oh, well, they had two. Um, I'm going to get back to you on that in a second here. And then there was a group called Ultra Groove, and that was Chili Charles and his brother Vince Charles, along with Mike Borman. Um, How many years as you go along, Roger? That helps. We're, we're still talking in the earliest 80s. Oh, okay, early 81, 82. This interview, well, it had to be before 82 because this interview was uh, done in October 81. Mm -hmm. all, all of these people were active up until that point. Ultra Groove, and then um, they they sponsored a big festival in Thousand Oaks, and it drew thousands of people to a mountaintop in the valley with six different uh, local bands. Wow. Uh, Zeph and the Ravers. Do you remember Zeph and the Ravers? I, I, I wasn't here them time. I do not. No? Well, that was a big band, and Zeph was very popular. He had a great voice. He worked quite often with Ron Miller. Um, he lived in a motel, and he made his living betting on races at horse tracks. You was know Jamaican? Uh, Jamaican, yeah. I, don't like, I see what I mean. <laughs> I figure. <laughs> yeah, right. Had to be, right? <laughs> and then, yeah, the on club, four or five nights a week, the mostly white and gay crowd, according to Howard Parr. Howard Parr is a big time uh, movie. He, music. He is. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, we actually interviewed him as well. And Oh, that uh, must have been great. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was so fun. Um, I think his, I think he just posted something on social media where one of, one of his films that he was just involved in was nominated I think for uh, for an Oscar maybe, mm. yeah. And then you, we got to talk about the Roxy because that's where Bob played in seventy six yes. and seventy nine when I was there. And um, okay, let's let's talk a little bit about my time with Bob uh, when we were asked to go on the road with him. Um, there were two nights when he wasn't working, Monday and Tuesday. And I set up two evenings at the Sunset Marquee. He re rented one of those big two-story, they called it a bungalow, but it's really a big, big house for the band. And uh, there were two films being edited in Los Angeles at the time. One was Jeff Walker's Smile Jamaica documentary and uh, a film he made of the entire Smile Jamaica concert. Mm -hmm. The other was Heartland Reggae, which was the One Love Peace concert film by a couple of Canadians, Jim Lewis and Randy Torno. So I told Bob about them and I said, I could set up an evening for each of them if if you want. And he said, oh, absolutely, absolutely. We got to do it because he hadn't seen, he'd never seen either footage. So on Monday night, we showed him Smile Jamaica. And I'd seen it so many times because uh, I was friendly with Jeff Walker, his publicist uh, at Island, who was with him when he, uh, the weekend he was shot. Um, and uh, Jeff brought the footage. He's Kim Gottlieb's husband, the great reggae photographer, rock photographer. And I sat in this room with about 50 people watching Bob watch Bob <laughs> and in the documentary the 20 minute documentary that Chris Blackwell suppressed and told Jeff never to show it anywhere because it was too political um, there's a scene where they go back to the house the day after the shooting and family man puts his fingers into the bullet holes in the wall next to where he was sitting that's how close it came to him being killed and when he put his finger in the bullet hole Marley started to laugh and laugh out loud. And I'll tell you, that whole room just froze. There was nobody else in that room laughing. And I I, I asked family about that several times. And, and uh, family didn't really know why either. He says, well, maybe he thought he could cheat death forever. But wasn't the case. So the next night, wow, next night was the peace concert. Okay. And Bob hadn't seen that yet either. And there is the immortal scene where he brings Manly and Siaga together and makes them yeah. shake hands in front of 40,000 people in the National Statement Stadium. And John Sutton Smith asked him what was going through his mind at that moment when he's standing between murderers, basically. And Bob said, well, I'm on no... No politician, but if I'm an a politician, only one thing for me to do, kill them both. 
and wow. some uh, privately i'll tell you what happened afterwards <laughs> so that that was a, a really emotional night to, to yeah. be in, in that circumstance Absolutely. And I remember driving the first day down to do the show at the San Diego Sports Arena. And we passed by uh, Nixon's house in San Clemente. And I wasn't supposed to talk to Bob. Nobody was supposed to talk to Bob on the bus, but he came back and sat one aisle behind us right across from me. You know, I could touch him practically. And uh, so I said, hey, Bob, look over there. I said, that's that's Nixon's house. You see all the big antennas and stuff. That's Nixon's house. And Bob looks at me and he says, yeah, what year him president? <laughs> that a man more than a year long enough to do some serious damage <laughs> right. and the other great memory i have is the last day i saw bob uh, that was the day he was signing autographs at the uh, uh at tower records there's even a picture of that in the uh, big show at hollywood and highland now um and the first 45 minutes or so of, of the sound check, he kept singing something over and over and over again. I'd never heard before about redemption. Mm. He was still writing that redemption song at that point. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I have a great eternal regret about that time. Don Taylor, his nasty manager, his damager, he called him, uh, mm -hmm. told the journalists, don't talk to Bob. If he says something to you, just give him a simple answer and don't start a conversation. Uh, don't go near him. Don't approach him. Stay away from him. And uh, we're, we'll do a press conference in the dressing room in the, in the San Diego sports arena, but don't talk to him. So I had a bag of all my Bob Marley records with me. And at, at that point, I'd gotten some really great stuff from Hank. I had Judge Knott. I had one cup of coffee, his first solo singles. Mm -hmm. I had a a test pressing on yellow vinyl of Simmer Down. And I thought, oh boy, I'm going to be with Bob for almost two weeks. I'll get these signed. So um, I sat in the in the seat on the aisle across from Bob, who was on the aisle, one, one row back. And I put the records on my lap and I started leafing through them. And I feel this <laughs> tap on my shoulder and it's Bob and he's reaching for the bag of records. And, oh boy, so I pass it over to him. And he, he sat with him for about 20 minutes why didn't I hand him a pen? Why didn't I guess just say, oh, Bob, would you mind blessing your records? But I was so afraid Don Taylor would throw me off the tour and I'd lose all these opportunities. So beyond from that point on, I kept waiting for a five or 10 minute period when I felt I wasn't imposing on him, but he was being hit on. You know what it was like being around, but everybody was after him all the time. It, right, right, right. So I never got them signed, and I didn't mind that much because we were friends now. He gave me my nickname, Roja. Roja, come here, Roja. And it wasn't Roger. And I figured, he's back every year. Bob comes every year. We're friends now. Fine, I'll wait till next year. Next year never came. So, so, so from that so, point on, I was a real pain in the ass. When Peter <laughs> came back to town, sure, I brought yeah. every record he ever made, and I sat there till he signed every one of them, and then I did the interview. And that's why, you know, about 40% of all my records are signed. So, but did, so did, did you not get Bob's autograph on anything? I did. I got it on a newspaper I stole from Jimmy Cliff's house in 1976 in Kingston with a big article about Bob. So he signed it and Family Man and Neville, they're all in the article okay. that's framed. It was in the museum yeah. in Queen Mary. And I have um, the poster. Of course, yeah. by him and the entire band and most of his family, all the melody makers and the, the saints and sinners, Chris Blackwell, Danny Sims and uh, Don Taylor. Wow. Yeah. 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 So, so, so. And then there's a record. I, ha I have an autograph Natty Dread record. OK, so you had once told me, uh, and I'm sure you've told this publicly, so I'm not putting you on the spot, but you have a. <laughs> A funny yet tragic story about Scratch, Leaf Harry. And if I'm not mistaken, if I, if I get this right, you had asked him, or he was looking at something that was autographed, and didn't he? You know what I'm talking about? Will, will you will you tell that story, Roger? <laughs> you know, Scratch hated Peter Tosh. Really hated Tosh because Tosh thought Scratch Scratch ripped them off, and he probably right. did. Of course. Um, and let me see, I, I have it. I don't know if you'll be able to see this. It's it's the 
the third record there. Okay. And in the middle of it. Oh, yes. The there we go. Of, you see, oh, see the scratch? Right. It's all, all scratched out. <laughs> that was Peter Tosh's autograph. And before Scratch would sign the record, he yeah, scratched right. Peter out. And then he, he, he right, what, hate, hate hell ball called, something like that. And he scratched Peter's face out on the back of the oh. album. These, oh. these were all in the Queen Mary show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I'll, I'll show you something funny. There we go. Endless, endless stories from the great Roger Steffens here. <laughs> I love it. Oh, wow. See his hands? Yes. Yeah. Green. Dollars and cents. <laughs> Money. Oh, okay. Lee Perry's hand prints. Wow, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> They'll go into the museum, huh? Yes, right? yes, yes, yes. So Eric asks you about Lee Scratch Perry, the 10th wonder of reggae, as I love to refer to him. I want to ask you about Joe Higgs, the teacher of, teacher of legends, and what role he played when he came to Los Angeles. Uh, of course, you met him. Enormous, 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 enormous. And another sad thing in my reggae life, because uh, I'd been hired to write his autobiography with him, and we did many interviews, but we only got up to like the late 70s, mm -hmm. and then he died in 99. And so the story was incomplete. But, you know, you, you think about the 60s and 70s, that was the primest Joe Higgs time, although he made great albums in the 80s, too. But he told me his life story up to that point, and I've still got all the interviews. I'm hoping someday somebody will put it all together. Yeah. I, feel, I feel really bad that never happened. Um, Joe was the teacher of the Whalers. A mutual friend named Earl, an East Indian man, paid Joe back in 1959 to coach 14-year-old Bob Marley, who had ambitions to become a singer in Trenchtown. And he didn't feel Bob was ready in 1962 when Bob ignored him and went to Leslie Kong and recorded... Uh, Judge Not, which was a country and Western cover. <laughs> and it was proven recently that so was One Cup of Coffee, mm -hmm. a country and Western cover, despite the fact they both are attributed as writer to Robert Marley. I no. actually found the original, uh, um, that song. Oh, you did? Yes, on online. Somebody posted that it wasn't bad. Yeah, it's, uh, they're both on YouTube. Okay. Yeah. So um, those flopped, and then Joe continued to tutor him and and uh, Peter Tosh and the man, the youngest man in the group, uh, Junior Braithwaite, who had the best voice. And um, they had two two women. Uh, the, the first woman was uh, er, er, Ermine Bramwell, who was called Cherry Green. And um, when it came time to record for Coxon, uh, she had a, a baby and she was working in a grapefruit factory and she couldn't afford on a Monday to go to the session. So they uh, recruited a young woman uh, named Beverly Kelso, who they had seen the night before in a kind of talent show in Trenchtown and liked her voice, okay. went to her mother on Sunday and said, we want her to join the Whalers. And depending on who you believe, there's three different stories in my oral history book, so much things to say, from Seiko, who took them to the audition, and Coxon, who conducted the audition, and Beverly, who sang in the audition, and they tell three completely different stories of how the audition went, when and where it went, and when they recorded the song. So the epigram in my book is, there are no facts in Jamaica, only yes, versions. <laughs> versions. But, but you know, Raja, I, I, I'm inclined to believe uh, that the, who you said, uh, who have, I, I forget the name. Seiko and Beverly. No, no, the person who said Bob was ready. I, I think he was ready. It was Desmond Decker who told him because they used to work together. Right. But Eric Morgan told me when Bob came for audition, you know, because Derek Morgan, he rejected Toots, said he wasn't quite ready. He turned down, um, Desmond Decker said he needed more time, but he said Bob was ready. So that's debatable. Hmm. Uh, and those, I mean, Toots went on to become one. Well, need I of explain? Course, right. Desmond Decker as well, but he said uh, Bob Marley was ready. I, well, by that time, it had been five years. No, 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 I'm talking about when he um, did those two songs for Beverly. If you were to go back and. Oh, I see. I, no, I went right. in 62. Yeah. yeah, I think they were comparable to anything else that was recorded at Beverly at the time. Yeah, yeah. It's debatable. 
But then the heart you add the harmonies. There's a gorgeous piece that I lifted oh, yeah, from right. uh, Bob Andy. Five people uh, singing on one person. Website, like, you know, and, and Bob Andy goes in the back room at Cox and and he hears the whalers singing together and describes it as something like a dream. Uh, you, you can't believe the camaraderie and the love among them and and how their harmonies were developed and just the perfection of of their music. Wow. Uh, I, I, I'm reading that as part of my tour of the uh, Bob Marley experience yeah. to and people. So we credit Joe Higgs again. Yeah. Joe Higgs, absolutely, all the way through uh, the, the Coxton audition. And he's on a couple of the tracks, and his wife, Sylvie, are, are, uh, is on a couple of tracks uh, with yeah, Whalers and Coxton. Yeah, and so incidentally, he did tour with them when Bunny decided not to travel. He did, and Bob didn't pay him. Oh. You haven't read my book. No, I have no, I have not. So, Same on you. <laughs> and, and he, had, he had to pretend to be a madman and hang around Tough Gong in 1974 after that aborted British tour when he replaced Bunny, mm. final tour of the Whalers, right? The original Whalers. And uh, he was supposed to get after Bob, you know, was persuaded uh, by Joe acting like a madman that he should pay him, he promised to pay him. And um, he said, all right, see Skill Cole, who, who was managing the group at the time, and uh, I'll give you $2,000. And Skill Cole peeled 500 off it and kept it for himself. So all, all Joe got for that awful winter tour of England was 1500 bucks. Sad, yeah. And he was one of the very first artists who knew the, the importance of owning your own publishing. Yes. And, Right. He advised an awful lot of early young artists yes, sir. Yes, the same sir. thing, and most of them didn't listen to him, to their regret. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why he, you know, he didn't have one record after another, year after oh. year. He held on to his own material. He, he mentored Pipe and and, and Oh Brett, yes, and all the guys from Oh, the Wailing Souls. Yeah, they were the same yard. Yeah. And he 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 left Jamaica. He was very angry because of how people treated him. Well, he had to leave Jamaica. Uh, he made that record in uh, 1980 80 during the elections called "So It Go." When you have when you know have big friend, right? Siaga people came to kill him. Mm -hmm. Wow, really? Yeah, that's why he came to L.A. And in addition, he needed help. I think uh, in Jamaica, a lot of people who he had helped turned their backs on him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So, so we're blessed. We were blessed to have him here in Los Angeles. He became a mentor to so many of those young groups. You know, a lot of the people whose names I've mentioned so far yeah. were directly coached by Joe Higgs. Right, right. Here in Los Angeles, not just in Jamaica, but in Los Jamaica. Angeles. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, having people like that and members of the Soul Syndicate here in town to to right. coach young musicians that was the greatest gift of all. And yeah. Ross, Ross Michael. So I was going to add in. Oh, my God. Yeah, we haven't even discussed Ross Michael. who has been here on and off since 1980. And, and you know, the Rastafarians. I mean, I thought that was one of the great American-based reggae bands group. in and history. Talent. That debut album of theirs, Haile Maskell, what a brilliant songwriter he is. I'm, I'm, helping, not, I'm, him, I'm helping him write his autobiography right now, by the way. Oh, and he's got stories to tell. I bet. I but Vision Walker was in that group. Vision replaced Bob when he went to Delaware in 1966. He was Rita's cousin. And he's on, on a lot of the Rude Boy songs. And he he was in the Rastafarians. And and, and uh, Shakaman, the drummer. Oh, right. Yes. Fun. Drummer extraordinary. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So 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 would you say that that having so many Jamaican legends living here in the Southland helps to contribute to the the uniqueness and the specialness of of the reggae scene here? It was and and the fact that you know I I don't mean to blow my own horn but our our show certainly had an influence. Oh, course, big views larger than life. And uh, Lance Linares up on the Central Coast and in uh, Santa Cruz, who became the, the culture commissioner of Santa Cruz County um, after managing this underground radio station, Cusp. And then Doug Went, uh, who was one of the great club jocks of all time, the first VJ I ever saw in my life at the Kennel Club. What phenomenal uh, world music shows he did. He'd get people from 30 different countries dancing to everybody's music 
And he had special video cameras set up all over the place. And he had movies going all at once and Fillmore shows, light shows. Um, and we were all roots people like you guys. We were into the the, the true masters of the form. We, we weren't really playing two-tone music, uh, although Doug liked some of that stuff. But it, we we wanted the true ghetto citizens singing about truth and rights yeah. from the point of view of the sufferers, showing you how it felt and uh, making ethereally beautiful works of art. Mm -hmm. That's and, and and to this day, I think Californian uh, California's musical taste, uh, have been directly influenced by that part, portion of Jamaican music. <laughs> and uh, Daddy Roy lived out here as well, yeah, right? Four times. Yeah, he lived in an apartment in Anaheim. You Roy? He lived in an apartment in Anaheim. That, that just blew me away. You Roy in Anaheim. Come on. <laughs> right, right. Well, and Stranger Cold? Yes, yeah, Stranger Cold, right. He was very... He was here. Yeah, it yeah, was a comment. And, and um, uh, Scorcher, you know, our friend Scorcher. Yes, yeah. yes, uh, yes. yes. He had two big hits in Jamaica. I he did? Know. You knew that? I did know that. Yeah, he yes, told me. Yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Del, oh, Del and the Sensations. Do you remember Del yes, and the Sensations? Yes, you know. They were a Trini group, but they played some reggae. Right. Um, what is this? My pen ran out of ink. Oh, Caribbean <laughs> All Stars. Uh, they eventually became known as Rhythm, a band named Rhythm. Right. Alan yeah, Stevens yeah, yeah. from Guyana, who lived here. Scorcher. Uh, Richard Skidmore and Tequila Mockingbird. They were early promoters. And that's where Bob Marley Day started uh, with the Extremes and Jack Miller. Um, Bob died on Monday, May 11th, 1981, and that following Saturday, we had uh, uh, reserved MacArthur Park for a free, mostly ska concert, and that turned into the very first Bob Marley Day. That turned wow. into the memorial to Bob Marley Day, and uh, KJLH, Stevie's mm -hmm. station, promoted the heck out of it. So we had 5,000 people in MacArthur Park. What? Incredible. And I emceed that show. And uh, the most moving moment was about halfway through the afternoon when we had a minute of silence for Bob. Wow. And you could have heard a pin drop in MacArthur Park. You didn't even hear a baby yeah. cry for I a full minute. And that was the first Bob Marley day. We And every kind of person who lives in this city was in the park that day and there wasn't a single that. incident oh no no, of no any no, no. kind nothing but love and and mournful love and mm -hmm. the following year we decided we'll do it again in macarthur park that was great and they sent a whole squadron of mounted police mm -hmm. so that you couldn't lie on the ground you couldn't let the kids play because the cops were galloping through the crowds and that sucked. So I think the next one was on the grounds of the uh, Veterans Center. Oh, right. But no, the federal building in, in Westwood. Okay. And then the next one was at, uh, we actually did it at the Santa Monica Civic. And then we did it in a stadium. And then from there on, it was in Long Beach. Arena, so yeah. the great yeah. Bob Marley day that we all remember so well started with the memorial in Barbara Barabino, who succeeded C.C. Smith after uh, the magazine came <laughs> full-time job for her, the beat, right. yeah. uh, which started as a playlist in the reggae beat and got bigger and bigger and then distributed all over the world through Tower Records. We were getting fan mail in uh, Swahili and Urdu. <laughs> I, I love the beat magazine. Yes, indeed. Yes, so it really serves a huge purpose. But I wanted to talk about a little bit about your book, Raja, the scrap book. Because you're not tooting your own horn, so yeah. maybe we should. Yeah, the, the reggae it's throw your horn for you, right? The reggae scrapbook. Oh, the reggae scrapbook with all the things you pull out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's that wrong. That was fun. That was fun. Um, yeah. Uh, still in circulation. Was... Still available. No, uh, it's you probably can find used copies on the internet, but don't buy anything that hasn't uh, has been opened, because people take them. 
the the things out of it, the posters and the flyers and the, oh. all the different goodies that you could remove from it, you know, and then they sell it. So you want to make sure it's a se mint sealed before you buy it on the internet. Right. It's also in French, it's called Reggae Collection. Oh, I know that. Okay. <laughs> excellent, excellent. In fact, this this book is interesting. The the right. latest. Uh, That's the latest one. Yes. With introduction the, by LKJ. Well, yeah. So it's alive today. Uh, he is. He is. So. It's the first book ever about Bob Marley in Chinese. Oh, and, goodness. and the title means the reggae king. But it's it's you know, it's all in Chinese. I don't know. I don't know how they translated Patois into yeah. Chinese. Yeah, it yeah. It's in port it's about to come out in Brazil and Portuguese. It's in Dutch, Spanish, French, <laughs> Chinese, and English so far. Wait, wait, uh, and, uh, sorry, are, are you saying uh, uh, different versions of of so much things to say, or are you talking different? Yeah, yeah there, there are translations. Yeah, uh, it's a book I spent 15 years on. Right. Wow. Uh, I had a major computer crash halfway through it that took all my notes, all the chapters I'd written, and then my my editor Jim Mars died. Oh. They turned it over at W. W. Norton to a, a wonderful man named Tom Mayer. Now I was on KCRW in L.A. He was at Columbia University on WKCR <laughs> doing a reggae show. And he had a ska band in the early uh, O's in New York City. So he was the ideal person. To yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he, I, I sent him nine chapters with 800 pages. And he said, this is not acceptable. Oh, <laughs> <you. laughs> he turned it into 35 chapters and 400 pages. Oh, so, you know, so you can read yeah. it in the bathroom. <laughs> and what's the biggest difference with this book? This book is the summation of what then would have been 44 years of research. It is my attempt to correct all the stupid rumors out there. Bob Marley's father was an English uh, naval, naval captain. Bob Marley's father was born in Clarendon, and he was a private in World War I who poured cement. And he was a, an outcast from the family. They, the family hated him. He was a wastrel. He was 64 years old when mm -hmm. Bob was born, and Bob's mother was barely 19. Um, and 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 all the things about the poison boot that supposedly happened and that mess up uh, his toe and and uh, Carl Colby Carl Colby uh, Jr. whose father had been the head of the CIA who was blamed for killing Bob for setting up the whole thing that's why I don't I, Marlon James gave me a great blurb for the cover of the book but you know I was so afraid that people would take a brief history of seven killings as fact, as a Ramana Clef. In other words, you just change the names of the people, but you tell the true story. And he has the figure representing Carl Colby arriving weeks early before the Smile Jamaica concert and arranging for the gang to come and kill him. And people believe that's the truth. And nobody ever interviewed Carl Colby. I found him in the Beverly Hills phone book. And I called him up one day. And uh, I asked him if he'd come over and do a TV show interview with me. And he did. And I had these magazines from all over the place with stories about him killing Bob Marley. Giving he knew him. about those stories? He had never heard any of them. Wow. And I have I have him on camera as he hears them for the first time. And he's right. so very, right. very upset. So he's got an entire chapter all made out to him. And then the thing about uh, Dr. Issels, the man who kept Bob alive at the end of his life against all odds um, uh, and how uh, people accused him of being a Nazi. Nazi turned out to be true. Oh, it was not just accusation. It wasn't just an accusation, but it's not what you think either. Okay. And his wife told me he got his MD in 1933 and he went to work for a Catholic hospital in Germany. And they said, if you want to establish a career, we think it's probably a good idea for you to join the SS. Hmm. You know, the people who killed the most Jews. Mm -hmm. And so he did. And in 1937, they told him he could no longer see any Jewish patients. Wow. So he quit the SS and they threw him in the army. 
And in the Second World War, they made him go into Russia in frontline combat. And he was captured and he spent a lot of time in a prisoner of war camp. Wow. And when he came out, he started working as a cancer researcher and they thought he was some kind of kook and they wanted to, uh, not dis whatever the word for disbarring of a doctor is. And they did a, a major government investigation and found out that what he was claiming for his cures was backed up by fact. Mm -hmm. And they let him out of prison and gave him his license back. Fascinating. So, you know, Bob had, had been given, you know, three or four weeks to live when they dis discovered how bad the cancer had gotten wow. in 1970 or 1980 in New York. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, he kept him alive to May. And he might have kept him alive longer, um, except for things that some of his friends did, Bob's yeah. friends. Right. Nothing I won't go into publicly. Right. But you know, the the book is filled with stories you've never heard before. I I tried for twenty years to get Beverly Kelso and Cherry Green to talk to me. They're on thirty tracks. I don't know if you knew that, Junior. No, sir. How could I? Uh, Between them, well, you could you could look at one of my other books. <laughs> you could look at uh, the definitive yeah, right. discovery. Oh, I, I I didn't even know about this book that Leroy Jody Pearson and I did in in two thousand five, yeah. uh, which tells you everything yeah. you want to know about every track they they ever did. Right. And right. Um, yeah, there are between them, they're on thirty tracks, and they never made a dime. They got two pounds each when they were doing a live show, so they could buy a dress. And they were pretty pissed off. They didn't want to talk about it. And I spent 20 years uh, with my friends, uh, the Midnight Ravers on WBAI in New York, Sir Henry Eccleston, Eccleston and, and the great Terry Wilson. And they finally arranged for, they found Sherry Green. She was uh, living down in Florida and they flew her up to New York and they brought uh, Beverly Kelso down from the Bronx. And I, I did nine hours of interviews with them, including a radio show at um, BAI, and, and Cherry died shortly after. So their stories are finally told. In the and book. Their role, and their role in the in the history is there for, for all time to come. Yeah. I, the original concept of this book was that I had 110 interviews uh, about Bob Marley from people who knew him. And I wanted it to be the raw material of history. I wanted to put every interview in there. Yeah. And then after the first draft, uh, and then I lost all of that in the computer, um, Jim Mars, the editor says, no, this this won't work. He says, why don't you break it up into, into eras, into subjects, and then take all the people who've talked about the Smile Jamaica affair and put those Oh, I see. Right. Together. The way an oral history is written. <clears throat> so that, that became a much, much better book, thanks to Tom Mayer. I, I, a little, it was a little more work, but yes. <laughs> right. Another five five years of work, in fact, yeah. Oh, my gosh, Roger. Uh, yeah. So. Um, Roger, I, I was going to take us back to your archives again. Uh -huh. uh, you have had some incredible and numerous musicians and actors and dignitaries visit your archives over the years. Who who surprised you to be a big reggae fan? Giselle Bündchen. Uh, Leo DiCaprio brought her over one day. And, um, you know, Bobby De Niro told me you should never drop names. And, uh, <laughs> Let people lose their job. <laughs> it's a joke, folks. <laughs> so, but it's true. I mean, mm -hmm. his, um, his best friend we've known since he was born, a mutual friend, and he set it up for them to come over. That's so great. The two of them, especially Giselle, knew so much about Bob Marley's history. Mm -hmm. And they, they probed me on the assassination attempt. We've talked about that for a long time and they wanted to know everything i had found out and why and who and how right it's right. very interesting to have them here and keith keith richards yeah. came one of my favorites well, well, he's keith, not, yeah, uh, from england so the, uh, what do you discover uh, discovered about the assassination attempt there's no doubt that it was led by jim brown who was one of the major figures in the uh, posse that followed the jamaican labor party they were mostly teenage gunmen if it had been the CIA, they wouldn't have missed. They shot Bob point blank and just scratched his chest and ended up bullet ended up in his arm. So it wasn't a quote professional hit. 
If it were the CIA, they would have, wouldn't have left till everybody was dead. Um, whether the CIA knew in advance or not has never been proved. I would love to find that out and prove it. I'd be screaming it from the rooftops. I've been accused of being a CIA agent because I want to say- When I came to people told me to stay far from you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any American who goes to Jamaica is automatically CIA. <laughs> I, I but, um, you know, I, I've, I've never seen any proof. No one, has, no one has ever come up with any proof. But the closest was that uh, really fine documentary that's on Netflix now, uh, Who Shot uh, Bob Marley? Yes. Uh, or is it who shot the sheriff who shot bob marley yeah yeah, yeah that's and right. um they got siaga just before he died to pretty much say i always had a couple of people to insulate me from the various things that went on mm -hmm. so that that to me was a confession that he knew i don't know if he gave the order right of course he made it be known that he he didn't want that concert to happen right yeah and he was a CIA, so I'm not sure how. Yeah, bought and paid for. Absolutely. All right. Okay. All right. That speaks volume, volume right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what is and, it? I don't know. Have you read Chris Blackwell's book yet? The I uh, somebody gave me as a gift, but I haven't. Is I'm it worth it? I was prepared to hate it. And I loved it. I couldn't put it down. Okay. There's blank spots in it. He doesn't mention Island America at all or Mango Records at all. It's mm -hmm. as if they never happened. Why is that so sad? Me. I don't know. I mean, I was, he made me, I was such a critic of his that uh, he, he, wow. he hired me to shut me up. And he made me the national promotions director of Island Records in 1982 in charge of reggae and African music. So I did King Sunny a Day. I did Night Nurse. I did Confrontation, Michael Smith uh black uhuru and uh, i lasted a little less than a year yeah about an average lifespan for an island employee and, and if i heard you correctly you said no mention of the labels mango and island none none jeff walker who worked for him for years who filmed smile jamaica for him hmm. not even in the book I, th I think one i think there's one sentence about jeff yeah yeah, wow. but but for what he does put in there, it's absolutely fascinating. There's two full chapters on Marley. Uh, there's of course a lot of you too, but yeah. you know, Cat Stevens, John Martin, yeah, Mary yeah. Faithful. Uh, I'll have to check that out. It is. It's well worth reading. It's okay. a history of music from the late '50s forward, and yeah. he was a key figure in it. He had the best years in the business. Absolutely. I'll pull it out. It's it's catching uh, collecting dust at home. So, what is the family asset, Roger? Um, I got some right here. You want to drop? You want to drop? <laughs> uh, oh yeah, yeah. That's my favorite drug. Okay, the family acid. Is it really? I you, say no. You acid? No, man. No. I I, I take nothing stronger than water. <laughs> no, sir. Okay. That's well, I met my wife on an acid trip in a pygmy forest in Mendocino under a total eclipse of the moon. On Tim Page's birthday, Tim was my roommate. He's the guy that Dennis Hopper plays in Apocalypse Now, the mad photographer from oh. Vietnam. Right. Um, so I, I have favorable attitudes toward acid. Um, the family acid started in the corner back there uh, where my son, Devin Marley, who's a wonderful electronic musician, um, spent all of 2013 seated uh, digitizing 40,000 slides that I began shooting in wow. November of 67 when I arrived in Saigon just before the Tet Offensive. And uh, there's 26 months of Vietnam pictures and pictures from all over the Far East, Australia. And, and then I lived in Marrakesh after the war for a year. I didn't want to be an American anymore. I spent a lot of time in Europe. And so wherever I went, uh, I, I was shooting. Sorry. And I shot slides through uh, 1993. And he spent a year digitizing 40,000 of them. And then our daughter, Kate, who is a digital archivist at the San Jose State, um, said, why don't I start an Instagram? And I'm, I'm totally technophobic. I don't even own a cell phone. And she explained what Instagram was. And I, yeah, sure, start an Instagram. Well, we've got 54,000 followers. What? I've got a major gallery in Chelsea in New York. I've been exhibited at Paris Photo and Art Basel and in museums in different parts of the world. And there's three books. The first book's got the, the most incredible reviews of, around the world. And um, I, I mean, I, I, in my 70s, I was suddenly 
gifted with a, a new career as a quote photographer. Right, right, right. <laughs> and you guys know you never see me without my cal- camera. Yeah, that's, 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 yeah. that's true. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's true. And so I, then I shot prints from uh, 1993 to 2005. The musician prints. Prints, and I've got 60,000 prints. So Katie's been digitizing the negatives of those. Wow. And, and since then, I've shot 600,000 uh digital frames uh and i've got a whole lot of themes that i shoot but my whole reggae life has been uh, photographed and uh, the second book was a, a book of jamaican photographs that the rock house hotel in the grill did yes and, and it's called the family acid jamaica and the third one is a big book called uh, Ca- family acid california and that's about that's sold out and it's about to be reproduced by a, a european company so it'll have european distribution oh, nice. great. yeah and oh so the title uh comes because katie said when she was growing up her friends told her our family was like the waltons on acid <laughs> 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 survive wow wow yes well <laughs> that's very apropos i love it now, you know i've still got a page of notes here and i'm probably going to be really angry at myself if i don't mention run, it run, run, run through them run through them before we wrap this up yeah how much time we got left uh, well enough time for you to to, to run through that well, right. we won't ask any more questions so. <laughs> um there was oh tony doman uh, he had a record shack, I and I Records, <clears throat> and Hank, <clears throat> Hank considered him his Rasta mentor. Did yeah. you ever meet Tony yeah. Doman? Yes, a, yes. A. A. Doman. Yeah. Hank produced a record by him, and that made the top ten in New York City. Uh, Music Odyssey with Jerry Sheffield and Matt Dinsmore um, on Wilshire and West L.A. Rhino, Rhino, man, that was a oh, great that was a great man. man. Yeah, exactly. And they would confer with me quite often, and the owner. Um, would call me and say, hey, I, I got some really good albums, but I only have one copy each. You want them? And I'd, I'd run down and, wow. and get them for the show the following Sunday. And if uh, and then people would come in and ask for them, so you'd have to order more. The Rhino, we we worked together. And uh, Here and Now on Sepulveda he, Records, Sound Spectrum, Laguna Beach, yeah, Jim yeah. Otto. Big, oh, yeah. big yeah. ups to Jim Otto, reggae DJ on the air for years, excellent taste in music. Poobahs in Pasadena, mm-hmm. used record store that stocked a really nice reggae selection. Aaron's, the old Aaron's record uh, when it was on Melrose. Right. And Tower Sunset. I mean, Tower Sunset really had good stock on a lot of imports. Too. Yeah. San Diego, Dave Allard and Chris Defari and, and, um, uh, uh, you know the reggae roots, reggae roots in uh, down there. Elliot, Elliot, uh, Elliot yes. Makeda Dread at at the Prophet Restaurant with Adashima doing her promotions down there. Uh, Kali Dolly, I told you about. She uh, she did a radio show on WNUR that finally she was afraid to go and do anymore because uh, the K- the Ku Klux Klan, our dear friends out there in, in Dominguez Hills. Um, told her that she had to stop playing that n-word music oh, or they'd come wow. and kill her you mean that's right here in southern california that's why she stopped playing yeah. wow. right here in southern california oh yeah hey that part of uh, southern california it's full of clans and mm-hmm. worse mm. yeah come on um <clears throat> oh uh, okay berwin spear mike yeah that that mostly is is what i wanted to share that's, with you and, that, that and, and big up these people whose lives were dedicated livicated <laughs> to the music to spreading it to give it a, a wider audience in a, in the proper way yes and rastafari was at the core of all of it yes and it was you know over great. the years we've lost quite a few people from uh the from Barbados, Eastern Caribbean island, we lost uh, what's his name, keyboard player, recently a few weeks ago. George, oh, he the, ran off with that. I'm not sure if you heard. Yeah, yeah keyboard George, player George. George, George from the unknown band. Yes. Yeah, man, he's gone. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I. Love you're not on social media. Yeah, you're, you're, you're yeah, missing out. Right. He, he yeah. played yeah. A, in a lot of different groups and. Yes. And, Right, right. It was just one of the nicest people I've yes, ever foundation. known. Foundation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, his son is following his, 
following yeah. in his footsteps now, working yes. with Ziggy. But oh, Joe, yeah? But yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. A couple other yeah. people died. You mentioned him. Yeah, Lloyd Hemmings. Quite a few people died. Right. But yeah, you know, absolutely right. The the we have to give a lot of credit to radio DJs, journalists, so much from the scene, musicians, um, that are DJs, right? Um, record shops, so much. And and, and Roger, I want to thank you. Uh, should thank our our mutual friend Russell Gerlach, who introduced me to you many years ago, and I've had the pleasure of visiting your archives. In fact, Roger, thank you. You interviewed my wife Kelly and I. Shortly before uh, Kelly gave birth to my oldest uh, daughter Fiona, because you wanted to, to talk about you want you wanted to ask us questions about what life was like pre <laughs> pre kids. And, and was now, I right? I told you you <laughs> got to remember it. You, you're not going to believe you actually had a life like that. No, it's uh, true, is it? It was yeah, but that was very special. And, you ever uh, rewatch that film? We have, yeah, it was yes. recorded. Yeah, yeah, we nice. have it on video. Yeah, that, we, yeah, we need to nice. we need to play it for my daughters. Actually, hey. we'll, we'll do that next. But, uh, <laughs> but, but I, I I've learned so much from you over the years, and 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 listening to you, you know, on the radio, um, you writing, you know, in the Beat magazine, and and you, your contributions to Reagan Nucleus magazine over the years, and just I'm very thankful, you know, to have you uh, uh, consider a friend and 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 in my life, and I can't wait to take my family to. Uh, to the uh to the Bob Marley um exhibition and, yeah. and have you do a little tour. Experience the one love yes. experience. There we go. One love experience. <laughs> right. Yes. Roger, you've been an institution. So any closing thoughts before we uh lock shop? You know, reggae brings such good people together. And I've told you this privately, Junior, that if you had been here in 79 and 80. I never would have had the balls to stand on stage and introduce a burning spear <laughs> to the audience. I, 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 my life would have been a very, very different life if, if you had been here because you, you're a compliment. master. And, and you're Jamaican and you do it with such love and enthusiasm and you're a much better dancer than I am too. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I just want to pick you, you, you up uh, in a public way uh, yeah. for all the, the great stuff that you have done in your radio show, your, your podcast. And, and uh, I mean, look at all the stuff that you've been involved in, Eric. Uh, it's, it's uh, incredible uh, on the business side of it, on the promotion well, side of it, on uh, writing. A lot of unseen things, a lot of unseen, unheard that Eric does that. A lot of right. Oh. right. Mm -hmm. the, the powers behind the throne of mm -hmm. ja reggae music. Uh, <laughs> you know why I started to MC? In 1980, uh, it must have been 80, uh, Peter Tosh played the Roxy and he had an African-American road manager. And he introduced by saying, it's time for you to meet a, be a big raggae star. <laughs> Peter Tosh's announcer called it raggae. And I said, this can't be allowed to happen. And so my, my philosophy of emceeing is, you must first make the artist feel welcome in the town. You must let him know that we know about their career. We know the significance of what they have done. And I tell that to the audience. And then I work them up and give them the artist a big rousing. And now let's hear burning spear, you know, whip yeah. them up. Right. Give him a great thing, right. and 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 at the Dub Club where I, I did a lot of emceeing, you you've done a lot there too. The Dub Club, there were evenings when you know some of the early ska guys come, and the audience, which is often largely Mexican American, mm -hmm. is singing along to songs from 1961 and knowing all the words. And you go in the dressing room at the end of the evening, and some of these old guys are sitting in there, and they've got tears in their eyes. I. I didn't think anybody remembered me. And that, you know, yeah. that yeah. just makes you feel so damn good that yes, we, can, we can show them. You know, I'm looking at Stranger Cole there. I mean, this guy's been around for 50 <laughs> years or more. That's, that's incredible. And he's 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 about to come back, right? Yes, yes. Right. yes. When he, you know, he came on the scene when Derek Morgan went to England on tour. And so he auditioned for Duke Reed. 
and Duke Reed said, uh, he think he did one or two songs. Duke Reed said, I, you have a voice that I like. I want you to go sing with Patsy. Uh huh. Well, okay, well, go find her and you know, make the it. And the rest of the train line, line. Oh, many, 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 yeah. Songs. yeah. yeah. Songs, uh, many songs with Patsy, and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know who's one of your biggest fans on earth, Junior? Tom, Schna <laughs> Tom Schnabel. Oh, <laughs> Tom Schnabel listens to you every week to this day, <laughs> and and he just thinks you have the greatest taste in music. And he said, I would have put him on ahead of you if I had had the chance. <laughs> <laughs> You're crazy. <laughs> You're crazy. <laughs> yeah. oh. Well, uh, yeah, he's a big supporter. So he yeah. calls and donates and uh, check in every so often. Good old Tom. Donate yeah. to the station when we have fun drive. Yeah. He, nice. Yeah. Nice. Brought me on his show once. Yeah, he's well, pretty good. good. Yeah. yeah, man, he's a good guy, man. Yeah. Yes, he is. Oh, yeah, yes. he's amazing. Well, Roger, thank you so much for um for everything, for everything you 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 do for the music. Um, for the friendship and for for uh, sitting down and 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 reliving uh, some of your some some great memories, right? And well, there, these were names a lot of them I hadn't thought of in forty years. Ah, no, so, this has been a great uh, great education. So, Roger, how I get hold of that list? I uh, you can have my notes. Oh, you <laughs> oh, know what? Yes, I, should, yes. I, I should I should just give you the tape. Yeah, we love yes. to hear that. Yeah, I'll get you the tape right. and the notes and the notes. Yeah. That sounds that sounds uh, great. Definitely, definitely. Wow. Yeah. Look, amazing, man. It was a golden age, man. Yes, She's... yeah. I, I came here 86, 87, so I miss a lot of it. Uh, that uh, yeah, I left the show in uh, May of 87. Yeah. So I, I heard you. I heard the last of the show. Yeah. Like so 86 summer. And then uh came Jul uh, August in 86. So I caught the a tail end. But you know, I, I I would be remiss not to tell you that I remember. You were interviewing, I said, we're going to stop talking, right? Interviewing Alton Ellis. Yeah. And I had a roommate at the time, Marvin Jackson, uh, African-American. And he listened to Alton song. I, I can't remember exactly what, what song. And he said, uh, without instrument. And he said, oh, this guy's a genius. One of the best voices he's heard. You know, uh, Alton, no instrument at all. You, you ask him to sing something on the air. Yeah, a cappella. I, I loved it. I did diamonds do an intruder song called <laughs> Betty Don't Love You a cappella. That, that one remains with me. Still like, sends chill. Alter. I'm one gonna show you a voices he's ever heard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess that's after listening to Sam Cook Otis Reading and all oh, these right. right. Yeah, I said, Oh, this guy doesn't need any instrument, do you? <laughs> Sam Cook, my hero, Sam Cook. I just adore Sam Cook. Yes. I was listening to the Soul Stirrers yesterday. Oh, yes, yes. This was his last, Alton Ellis' last well year at Hollywood and Highland, in fact. I, 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 I kicked myself for missing that Me one. too. I'd seen him earlier, so I didn't know. <laughs> Persephone sang behind him that night. Yeah. Right. And that's Alex Desair, I think, too, right? Wow. Yeah, we had, we had arranged the, um, the back in bar. We did, we did, yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. Well, great way to end this roger oh yes sir until, with, uh, with some laughter yes <laughs> and, until next time i'm going to see you up at uh, hollywood and highland at some point soon very cool <laughs> every saturday and sunday 1 and 3 p.m i'll lead two tours a day and tell weeks. bob marley's life story and a lot of things people have never heard before and we will exit through the gift shop there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and right. uh, i'll so have you'll be there for six weeks so uh this will be up no, I think 12 yep, weeks. Till the end of April. Sorry, 12 weeks. So this will be up next week. So be, right. people will uh, miss just absolutely. one week. On it. Oh, okay, good. 11 uh, weeks. The copies of the oral history and of the, uh, yes. the very rare out of print uh, World of Reggae catalog from my Queen Mary show in 2001 with 1,600 full color illustrations. Yeah. Lots of memorabilia, lots of Rasta. Jim Marshall's Rasta, Rasta archive oh, nice. uh, is in the book. And... Uh, a lot of things that belong personally to Haile Selassie. Yeah. He loaned them to the Queen Mary yes. exhibition. Even and I think we're going to acquire some of his archives to put in the museum in Mobile. Oh, Bay. amazing. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Well, and this episode will air around Bob Marley's birthday, too. So it's so it's perfectly timed. So. Yeah, Monday. Monday is his birthday. And nothing nothing from your archive is at the... Um... Not a drop of anything. Oh, people! I've been asked that question numerous times. Numerous yeah, times. Nothing. You. 
Oh, I see. Just me. There we go. Wow. <laughs> the, most, the most important. <laughs> Junior, yeah. thank you as always. Much love. One love for, yes. uh -huh. for Ivor and Ivor. Uh, John Liv and yes. Keith. Yes. Keep, <laughs> keep up the great work, you guys. I love you yes. both. Mm -hmm. We appreciate that much. And I want to say you. thanks to everyone for their ongoing support. And please subscribe to this podcast uh, series and watch us on YouTube channel. Uh, follow at History of Alaska on Instagram and join us on Facebook. Yes. And yes. Please and follow this gentleman at mm -hmm. Junior Francis. And of course, the series is produced by a good friend here uh, for Rockery Radio at Rockery underscore radio. And we'll leave you with Please support our local music scene mm -hmm. and much love. Until next time, Junior, Roger. Yes, and buy Roger books. Yes, indeed. Take care. <laughs> One love. Respect. Much sir. respect. Bye-bye.